If you suffer from allergies and start to sneeze as soon as the season turns, you might not appreciate that pollen is a magical and powerful substance that actually holds the potential to solve forensic riddles and crimes. Masa Kikana headed to the University of Cape Town to meet a group of experts in pananology, one of a handful on the African continent. The case is known as one of the most elusive in British crime history. Around the turn of the century, two 10-year-old girls from the town of Soham outside London disappeared. Their bodies were found in a ditch 30 kilometers from home. Police made no headway in identifying a murder suspect until a forensic palynologist examined the scene and the pollen spores of plants flowering in the vicinity. Palynology, I just like that definition because it comes from a Greek word, the particles that are strewn or the study of dust. Head of the University of Cape Town's Lung Institute, Professor Johnny Peter, is collecting pollen data to build a database that can assist police, as in the famous British case. If it is around a crime scene or on a suspect's boot or on a, on a jersey or piece of clothing on the dead body, it can be used to be sure that the body you know, fits into that geographical area or if the bodies have been moved, because we would know that these trees were flowering in a particular area uh, at a given time of year. Although forensic palynology has been used as a method to assist police in solving crimes around the world, it hasn't ever really been practiced in South Africa. We take our lead from work that has been done by world-renowned forensic palynologists, of which there are only a handful globally. To date, Professor Patricia Wilshire has become one of the world's most famous forensic palynologists. Basically, the police will say, we know the person came to this place. Can you match this place with the shoes? Or they might say, we are looking for a body. We don't know where it is, but we have the suspect's car, shoes, whatever. I will analyze those. And from the palynological profiles I get from them, places form in my mind. Wilshire's knowledge of palynology combined with her extensive training in ecology and botany has helped the British police solve more than 300 cases. Professor Wilshire is the palynologist who solved the Soa murder case involving the two 10-year-old girls. She led the police to the killer by tracing the pollen spores found on the evidence. I showed that he had taken the clothes off the girls while they were in the ditch. I showed the police how he had got into the ditch. And I showed that he had been into the ditch twice and I did that from the straightforward body and also from the palynology on his footwear and in his car. Back at home, experts know of only one criminal case that has been solved using forensic palynology. Uh, in Neisner, where uh, a body was shown to have been moved based on the pollen that was found in the body. And that's helped solve crimes, essentially. The reasons why forensic palynology is not known or practiced in South Africa is not only because of a lack of skills, but also because of a major lack of pollen data, which indicates the type of pollen that occurs in a specific area at a specific time of the year. In the UK, Wilshire says resources in Britain are well established. We are lucky in Britain because the vegetation is mapped. We have wonderful databases in Britain. We can't say that for the rest of the world. But her knowledge of pollen and vegetation was built over many years of hands-on experience. I've been all over Britain doing field work, walking in woodlands and fields and ditches and swamps and so on. So I've got a good idea of what's mm -hmm. there. Very difficult in Africa. It's yeah. such a big place. So I think in Africa, you would have to regionalize one way to collect pollen data is by setting pollen traps. Although the traps are developed for medical research, they collect data that can be applied in any forensic investigation. The trap is designed to simulate human breathing patterns to determine the amount of pollen that enters a person's lungs on a daily basis. The trap pulls in about 10 litres of air per minute, which is relatively the same as a human being. Dr. Dillis Berman is an aerobiologist. She works with pollen traps designed in the UK that collect samples from the air in 24-hour cycles. She resets the trap every seven days. The air flows over the specially prepared strip 
and traps pollen and fungal spores onto the strip. Extracting the pollen from the trap installed at the Cape Town Astrological Observatory, the team analyzes and logs the findings in their lab at Khotiskir Hospital. So now we have the pollen from the strip and we're in the lab. What happens next? Well, now that we've taken the strip from the trap, we bring it back to the lab and then we will make slides from those segments. And this is the, the cutting block that we use to actually cut it up into equal segments so we know each one represents a specific day. Um, and then after you've made your microscope slides, you can look at it under the microscope and actually identify and count the different pollen grains from different plant species because the pollen from different plant species look completely different under the microscope. So you can actually identify the specific plant where that pollen comes from. At the moment, there are only seven pollen traps in South Africa's largest cities, but UCT plans to expand those so they could monitor all the different plant communities and vegetation types across the country. You can't monitor pollen in Cape Town and really have a good say what's going on in Joburg. So as a result, what, we, what we've put together and we're trying to grow this initiative is something called the South African Pollen Monitoring Network. It's not only pollen from the present that tells a story. From water bodies, grasslands and deserts, fossil palynologists like Dr. Lynn Quick, one of very few in Africa, are able to dig up and identify pollen spores that date back millions of years. The good thing about pollen and the species that we're looking at and the, the, the genus and families that we're looking at are that they haven't changed evolutionarily. So I can find the same type of plants over thousands to tens of thousands of years that we are seeing today back in time. And that's how I can tie in what kind of climates and environments we're looking at. Quick says it's the very structure of pollen molecules that makes them ideal for forensic inquiries. It's one of the most inert geological chemical compounds that we know of. And that's why it's so useful for crime scenes. Although pollen research is slowly expanding in South Africa, the lack of experts in the field remains the greatest challenge. We are trying to grow that network by training young scientists that are interested in pollen science and also connecting with other fields like fossilized pollen and those scientists that also can help us read modern pollen. The University of Cape Town is the only university in Africa that is focused on developing this research. It is for this reason that medics and scientists from other parts of the continent come here for training. Kenyan Dr. Evelyn Nganga is specializing in children's allergies. Her training with the team at UCT will make her one of the fellow pioneers working to expand the expertise of palynologists across Africa. It's my hope that with this training and what I have acquired over the year and a half I've been here, that I'll be able to identify and sort of do a nice um, database of the kind of conditions we are seeing in East Africa. Because as it stands, only South Africa is able to do that kind of um, pollen monitoring with, I think, a few traps in Nigeria. And that serves to be the representation of Africa, which is obviously quite an, an under-representation. Yeah, so we're hoping that could change. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.